Hello, fools. Uh, this is Vince Chen filling in today for Sean O'Reilly on this technology edition of Industry Focus. Uh, we are coming at you, as usual, from Full HQ in Alexandria, Virginia. And today we'll be talking a little bit about, I think, the overall theme is Samsung's woes, really. But in actuality, uh, some wearables numbers. Is that right, Dylan? Yeah, we're going to be getting in some uh, recent data releases from IDC and uh, kind of what the wearable landscape looks like touch on uh, some more bad news for Samsung. Spoiler alert, the wearable numbers don't look too great either. Mm -hmm. But uh, they've had some other developments come out this week, and uh, we'll kind of sift through that. Sure. Uh, so, can you tell us a little bit about these uh, results that came out from IDC? Yeah. So, IDC releases uh, wearable shipment volume data on a quarterly basis. And so, earlier this week, they released their most recent installment of that. Um, no huge surprises here uh, in terms of uh, what the landscape looks like. It pretty much mirrors what we saw last time in terms of the top of the market share. Mm -hmm. um, so Fitbit came in uh, with 4.7 million uh, shipment volumes. Uh, Apple was second with 3.9 million shipments. Uh, Xiaomi in third with 3.7. Uh, and just to give you an idea of what that means in terms of the larger market, uh, we saw about 21 million shipments. So the respective uh, market share as a percentage for those three top players, 22%, 18%, and roughly 17.5%. Okay, okay. Um, and where do we see some of the biggest shifts? I know that you know the Apple Watch came out, I believe it was April of this year, so that kind of threw things uh, a bit with a lot of new buyers coming into the market for the second quarter. And it looks to me like Xiaomi also had a really big boost, for at least year over year, for, for this most recent period. Yeah, I think the tough thing when you look at this IDC data is you know the wearables market is so nascent, and there have been these weird hop-ins from major players at different times. So a lot of the data is really lumpy, and yeah. you can't look. It, it's really kind of meaningless on a year-over-year -year basis, or even sometimes on a sequential basis, as, as we'll find out, uh, because the landscape has changed so dramatically in the course of you know even like three months' time or six months' time. Um, so if you want year-over-year -year growth uh, for what it's worth, just look at what the regular, what the whole market looks like. Uh, Q3 2014 saw 7.1 million shipments. Again, uh, 21 million shipments in this most recent quarter. So that's good for almost 200 yeah, percent increase in total list. market size. Uh, sequentially, we saw 16 percent growth. Uh, Q2 had 18.1 million shipments. Okay. So uh, that might be a little disappointing when you think about the Q1 to Q2 growth, uh, which was almost 60 percent sequentially, uh, and. This kind of plays into that lumpiness I was talking about a little bit. So, uh, again, the Apple Watch came out in Q2, and that was a product that added like 3.5, 3.6 million shipments to the category. Wow. Um, and I think another thing that's important to keep in mind here is this is the quarter right before the big holiday sales rush. And so yeah. I wouldn't be totally surprised, and maybe this is something you can add a little color on. You know, you talk CG a little bit more. Uh, but I'm guessing there are some folks out there that have something like this on their wish list. But or you know or think about buying it for someone else, but are going to wait until either the sales that come with the Black Friday season, Cyber Monday season, or uh, you know are just looking to wait just to give it as a holiday gift in general. Yeah, that is actually something I saw. Um, there's definitely been some uh, echoes that Apple uh, will prove to be a big winner. You know, I guess as usual for the at least the Black Friday, Cyber Monday period, where uh, where their iPads and their Apple Watch uh, saw a lot of buy-in, especially with the just a little discount that they needed. I think it was like fifty dollars off, for example, the Apple Watch to get people at the level where they would be willing to try it out. Mm -hmm. uh, they also launched uh, like some native apps for the device, which I think have got people a little more excited about it too. So it's definitely, uh, I definitely think the Apple Watch was a hot item for the Black Friday period. Yeah, and looking at some of the other company specific takeaways from this data release, sure. Um, you know, we talked about some of the big names. I think uh, you know, so Garmin kind of held constant at uh, you know it being slightly relevant in the space, but not like really worth talking about all that much. Sure. You know, like, uh, but I, I think the biggest surprise is uh, the player that came in at number five, which is uh, new to a lot of people, um, is Chinese manufacturer XTC, which is owned by BBK, uh, and they displaced Samsung to be the fifth largest wearable shipper uh, in the most recent quarter. And I think the last time we did this check-in on this quarterly data uh, about three months ago, you know, we said Samsung was one of the biggest losers uh, because you know you look at some of the big tech companies out there, and they're owning the space. You know, like Fitbit's com uh, Apple's coming in and immediately becoming the second biggest player. Yeah. Samsung's been around for quite a while with products and hasn't really seemed to make it work, mm -hmm. and they are losing market share to you know these tiny players that 
you know, are just establishing themselves. And you think of the resources that are available to a big tech company like that, and you have to think, like, you know, what, what's going on over there? Yeah, the, the really surprising thing for me, too, that when you mentioned with BBK is, you know, they grabbed up that market share, was able to display Samsung. And it sounded like it was just from one device that they have that's kind of targets younger consumers. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, but, you know, in terms of a geographic basis, uh, where else uh, are you seeing like where the market's really strong for wearable devices? Yeah, another thing that IDC noted in their release was how particularly strong the Chinese market was. Uh, so they said in a statement, uh, China has quickly emerged as the fastest growing wearables market, attracting companies eager to compete on price and feature sets. And uh, you can't be surprised when you hear them talking about price competition there, right? You know, you immediately think of Xiaomi, which is, you know, I think they make a $15 uh, Mi Band. I, th- I think that's what it costs oh, for consumers. Wow. It is, I did not know it was that. It, it's it was absurdly that low price. cheap. Um, and, you know, a couple of figures that just kind of underscore the rise of that market. Uh, 90%, 97% of volume for Xiaomi's Mi Band product shipped in China. And XTC, like I said, the fifth largest by market share. Uh, they claimed that position and only sold its Y01 smartphone, uh, smart watch, or phone watch product in China. So it, that was all domestic sales for them. They did not have any international presence. Um, so you look at uh, the foothold that they're able to gain in this, you know, still growing market, and being able to do it in just one country. Uh, it's a testament to what the appetite is for this type of technology in China. Okay. Okay. Uh, and just, I guess, another question uh, going off of that. Uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, seeing it as an opportunity or a threat too, with with Xiaomi is that, you know, they've seen such fantastic growth and they've hit so well in China. But you know, people have talked about their smartphones being really competitive uh, to to you know with high feature or great features, low price point. Like, um, and the issue is that you know, for example, their smartphone market share has remained pretty steady, about five percent, and that's pretty much solely focused in China. Yeah. So there's also this idea that will they be able to break into like these Western non-China markets? And I think right now, at least for their, on the smartphone side, they're targeting like Southeast Asia, India, and Brazil. But it'll, it'll be interesting to see where they're they are able to for their Mi Band, expand that interest into the U.S. market, for example. Yeah, it might be something where someone that wants to try a fitness product but doesn't want to spend a lot of money on it, yeah. you know, tries it out first, and then maybe they say, yeah, you know, like I want something that has a little bit more built-out functionality. I like that sure. it's able to do X, Y, and Z, but I want it to do A, B, and C as well. Um, so, it might be kind of like a gateway product for people here mm-hmm. in the U.S., but I think uh, you're going to see a lot of people in more developed markets looking for you know, some of that name brand association. Okay, uh, and you know, to wrap things up, are there any other trends in the data that you wanted to mention? Or yeah, I, I think uh, something that's worth noting is it seems like there are kind of two distinct product categories here. Something that I've always been really interested with, uh, you know, as far back as the Fitbit IPO, and you know, once we start start getting rumors about the Apple Watch, is are these two different segments going to merge into one, and is there going to be one winner? Yeah, right. And so uh, again, from their release. Smartwatches have drawn increased attention to the market from the likes of Apple, Motorola, Pebble, and Samsung, but this has not dampened interest in fitness trackers. Fitness trackers. By the end of Q3 2015, shipment volumes for both product categories increased sequentially and year over year, showing that, for now, the categories can coexist and grow. This also provides end users with a choice in terms of feature sets and functionalities, ranging from simple fitness tracking to smartphone-like experiences. Uh, so it seems like IDC, at least for the time being, is saying, there's stability in both of these markets, and there are consumers that are interested in both both kind of ranges of product offering. And I I think that's a little bit to the point of what we were talking about earlier, where maybe someone wants to try out a fitness tracker. They aren't sure they really want to let. They they don't want to commit to something that's uh, as expensive as an Apple Watch or something like that. And um, they try something from Xiaomi or maybe one of the lower level offerings from Fitbit, and kind of just whet their appetite a little bit and see if it's something they're interested in. Um, I don't know. How long this is going to hold? You know, I've always been kind of skeptical of this, um, but you know, it's definitely something to continue watching. Yeah, I think the concern is that, you know, right now I think, uh, kind of, you know, you either have your more higher end smartwatch, right, and the functionality there is simply wider than uh, like a fitness tracker that you might get from Fitbit. Um, and while those feature sets remain separate, the price points also remain separate. Where you can get a Fitbit for like fifty, sixty bucks, I think, mm-hmm. for their for their introductory models, whereas some of the nicer smartwatches will cost you several hundred dollars. Right. 
But I do think there's going to be a point, at least technologically, where they're going to be able to merge all of those things into one, and it will be at a very competitive price point where people will think, I'll just get the smartwatch that also happens to have some of those health tracking features, for example, and you might start to see more consolidation. Yeah, you look at the history of tech gadgets, and generally, the all-encompassing device wins out. Right, mm. people very rarely want a dedicated device that is capable of doing one thing very well. You know, like they're okay with having unless you're do, unless you're using it for like <clears throat> like nautical GPS or yeah. you know something that is a very focused use. Um, you know, most people are okay with a good enough product that has more range and functionality. It's just kind of like uh, you know the more basic. Uh, digital cameras too, and have they've kind of been like wiped out essentially by really nice cameras on smartphones. Right. So now that the, the, for at least for dedicated cameras, you really are in the market of like you know SL, DSLRs and, and higher end equipment, where of course that's going to produce a better better quality image. But otherwise, all the other point and shoots are pretty much not that popular anymore. Right. Uh, another thing to look at uh, that IDC noted was just that there seems to be some room in the middle of this market. Um, you know. So again, from their report. Uh, the average smartwatch or band came in at just over four hundred dollars, and the average basic watch band came in around ninety four dollars. Uh, this leaves a lot of room for new players like Fossil and niche players like Pebble, as they have an opportunity to address this space. So, uh, you know, I don't know if we'll start to see the blurring of the lines there. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think Apple made it very clear that they want to have this luxury product, and their pricing clearly indicated that. And you know, that the way that they rolled it out with these kind of like fittings and this, this very um, kind of like luxury, high designer type atmosphere in the stores and the experience that they curated with that, um, and you totally see the opposite end of the spectrum with Xiaomi and Fitbit, where they're you know much more accessible and, and very competitively priced. Um, so there might be some middle ground there, where you know it, I think one of the criticisms with something like an Apple Watch is that it is not it's not something that if I'm working out. And like you know, doing some heavy workouts, lifting weights, you know, like if you like ding it or something like that, you know, you'd be kind of annoyed, right? Yes. It, you know, if you scratched it or you, you maybe broke broke the screen or something like that, lifting, you know, like that's something that might happen. And so, uh, there might be this middle market here that develops. Um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, Fossil is publicly traded, uh, so that's something to look at. I, th- I think um, IDC, a lot of the names that they're throwing out here are you know private players right now, kind of smaller players, but. Um, you know, it will be interesting to see what Fossil does with that kind of space. Yeah, uh, and you know, some of these other competitors, like you mentioned with Fossil, uh, you know, a very significant portion of the market, you know, thirty-five percent is still not in the, those top five vendors that we right. talked about. So there's a lot of small players. Uh, you know, with Samsung getting knocked out, that doesn't mean that for the next quarter, uh, you know, especially with the holiday season, where one certain product might get a lot of popularity and surge with sales, suddenly, you know, we have another pl- new player or even two. In that top five, mm-hmm. I don't think we'll be able to unseat the top three, though. Yeah. So, and, and sorry, uh, just to look at kind of what the market's doing in terms of reaction to this news. So this oh, came sure. out. This came out on Thursday, um, and uh, as of like midday trading uh, on Friday, uh, both Fitbit and Apple are up. Uh, Fitbit a little bit more so because obviously they're more exposed to that. Sure. Um, Apple, I, I think, was maybe up two percent. You know, before we checked, uh, before taping. So um, you know, positive market reaction. You know, it. Xiaomi is obviously private, so you know, limited insight there. But um, you know, it market seems happy with the news. Um, you know, they, they seem happy with that 16% growth. I wouldn't be surprised if it was higher in the coming quarter, like we said, just because boosted by holiday sales. Sure. Yeah, and on that bill side, these some of these numbers, even for the Apple Watch sales, even if they're you know really successful during the holiday season, it's still just a drop in the bucket for them. Exactly. All right. Well, uh, you know, before we move on um, and really talk about that. Uh, additional hit to Samsung that we mentioned earlier. Uh, I highly encourage our listeners to visit the newly redesigned focus.fool.com. So, there you will find a special offer to join the Motley Fool Stock Advisor newsletter. Uh, you can have access to the special uh, discount with Stock Advisor that works out to just $129 for a full two year subscription. Let's just go to focus.fool.com to take advantage of this offer. Again, that's focus.fool.com. So, our Samsung and Apple. Kissing and making up here. Or what? I don't know. Maybe they're getting into the holiday spirit a little yeah. bit, right? Um, so earlier this week, uh, Samsung basically agreed to pay Apple roughly uh, 550 million dollars as part of this long-running patent dispute that they've had. Um, their patent disputes last longer than most relationships at this point. Five years running. Yeah, it's, which is insane. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I guess it's just a testament to how much they've like dug their heels in and just fought each other on this. Um, Basically, this dates back to 2011. Um, 
Apple said uh, Samsung was using some of its uh, patented technologies without permission. Uh, one of the ones that you know was cited in some of the examples was the like pinch to zoom functionality in OS. Uh, just to give you an idea of what this case centers on. Sure. Uh, and so this 550 million it seems like a big number. Uh, the reality is it's a fraction of what the original sticker price that Apple was asking for was, uh, which was like 2.5 billion. Oh wow! And courts had originally awarded Apple 1 billion. Uh, Samsung, through a series of appeals and things like that, talked them down to this 550 million figure. Okay. Um, is is this it? Is it over? <laughs> no, it's, it, it, that's the problem with this litigation process, right? Uh, it's never over. Um, and and of course, in terms of like, what does this mean for Apple? Like, this is a drop in the bucket for their top line. You know, you look at the two hundred billion plus that they made. Like, th- this is nothing. Yeah, of uh, over the last year. So, um, I kind of wanted to bring it up because I think I'm hoping that it marks more the end of this like highly litigi- highly litigious era for these two companies. You know, you you look back and like the 2010 to 20, you know, to present really period, and it's just been brutal in terms of like patent attacks. And um, you know, it's something that Steve Jobs was very adamant about was protecting tech and patenting pretty much everything. And um, you know, I think that there's definitely something to be said for that. Uh, but I, I think that this might be the two companies, in addition to some of the other things they've done, turning the corner a little bit and hopefully burying the hatchet. Um, uh, actually, in 2014, the two agreed to drop their patent disputes outside the U.S., and so they had ongoing patent disputes in nine other countries at oh, the time. Oh wow! Yeah, it's it's just insane when you think about the scope that uh, this runs. Um, and I think one of the one of the crazier stats that I came across uh, when I was researching the story was just uh, in 2012, the uh, New York Times had this article, and they mentioned last time uh, last year for the first time spending by apple and google on patent lawsuits and unusually big dollar patent purchases exceeded spending on research and development of new products according to public filings which, so which is insane give you an idea of you know how long this has been going on how expensive it is for them to wage you know this like battle in court against each other over such a long period of time it's really big numbers yeah and and i think some of this is um, just m- the maturation of People getting used to having these this functionality on their phones and different devices, and so like you know, if, if a feature's been around for so many years, at what point do you say like this is something that people are used to being able to do on their phones? And you know, there's definitely that element of it. Um, so, but but I do think that both companies are tiring of it a little bit, and uh, maybe you know their mom called up and said, "You guys, you guys need to play nice so that I'll feed you guys over the holidays or something." But. Um, there are still some elements of this that need to pass through. Uh, so basically, Samsung said once they receive notice of invoice from Apple, they will pay it within ten days. Um, Samsung is of course requesting a Supreme Court review of the case, so there, there is an appeal in there, but they are willing to pay the fine right now. Okay. Uh, and there is a clause written into this payment uh, that Samsung would be refunded the money should the U.S. Patent and Trade Office uh, find that the patent should not have been issued in the first place, which is something that has come up a couple times with some of these patents. Yeah, I've heard that the USPTO has some like internal investigations right now where they're evaluating where some of those early patents that they awarded to Apple might. Not sure should not have been awarded in the first place. Yeah. Uh, so this is kind of over. <laughs> yeah. Um, there, there will probably be a follow up at some point. Um, but I, I think more than anything else, this is just kind of more like the fascinating side of tech that you don't really hear about much. Um, there's some really interesting stuff written about uh, the patent process and kind of arming yourself with patents. And I kind of urge our listeners to check that out um, if this is something you're interested in. You know, they get into uh, the process that some of these big tech companies use just because they have these huge legal resources. And, um, you know, some of it is just resubmitting and resubmitting and resubmitting. It's like this war of attrition kind of against uh, the U.S. Patent Office. And so, you know, that's where you start to see these, uh, should these patents have been issued to begin with type things. Uh, but really fascinating stuff. Um, I'm hoping that the two companies can just kind of let it go at this point and uh you know play nice that that 550 million dollar settlement you know i'm not saying it's a small amount of money by any means to these companies though overall it is pretty much a drop in the bucket but you know i I think about it i remember when these uh when this legal battle first kicked off you know back in 2010 2011 at the time you know when the android apple war was like uh raging full on um i felt like this is almost like a symbolic, uh, you know, perception of 
which company is like leading the charge in terms yeah. of developments of smartphones, like Apple basically claiming, you know, we we started it all. Android or Samsung's just copying us with their devices. But honestly, at this point, five years later, there's a lot of good phones out there. I, don't, I just don't think people care that much anymore. Yeah, and I think you're totally right. <laughs> so, all right. Well, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, that wraps things up for us, fools. Uh, as always, we love to hear from our listeners. So, if you have any questions or comments, please email us at industryfocusatfool.com. Again, that's industryfocusatfool.com. And the people in this program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and the Motley Fool may also have formal recommendations for or against these stocks. So, don't buy or sell based solely on what you hear. Thanks again for tuning in. Uh, fool on. <laughs>